Which car company do you work for? A major one. We're here at the Quail Lodge with the CEO of Porsche Cars. To be the president and CEO of a car company like Porsche, did you ever intend to have this job? Probably not. No. So as the CEO of a car company, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> Who understands this stuff? It makes no sense. When you think of Porsche, you probably think of fast cars and finance bros. Porsches are expensive, but decidedly less flashy than their Italian rivals. So they do well with the people that want expensive sports cars, but don't want to explain what they do for a living every time they stop at a gas station. Nah, Italian trash. Besides, I only steal Porsches. What you might not know is that Porsche and the finance bros that enjoy the fast cars they make have more than a producer-consumer relationship. Porsche is itself effectively an investment firm that happens to occasionally make cars on the side. If you weren't confused already, Porsche Automobiles is owned by the Volkswagen Group, the company that makes the Golf and the Beetle. But the Volkswagen Group is owned by Porsche. The f you can also buy shares in Porsche, as well as Volkswagen, because they are both public companies listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. However, Volkswagen has announced plans to take Porsche public at the end of the year, even though it already is a public company. This corporate clusterfuck is only where the weirdness begins, because besides making cars, Porsche has investments in companies that make commercial 3D printers, laser systems, and satellite launch platforms. So it's time to learn how money works to find out why Porsche is really just a hedge fund that occasionally makes some cars. This week's lesson was brought to you by Noah, News Over Audio. If you're like me, reading isn't your best method of trying to learn something new. Since you're watching this video, I can imagine you're probably a visual or auditory learner. Noah is an audio app that brings you the world's best journalism, curated by editors and read aloud by professional voice actors. They don't just read you articles, though. A dedicated team of experts curate high-value and in-depth series by pulling together multiple stories from premium publishers like The Economist and Harvard Business Review, and add a narrator that brings it all together. I recently listened to a series on why many are losing faith in the Fed, and how they may be losing credibility. The narrator gave me the full picture of how we got here, the different sides of the story, and what's next for the central bank. If you'd like to listen to this story and others, sign up for Noah using the link in my description. My channel listeners get one month off Noah Premium access for free when they sign up using the link below. Now back to Porsche. The company was founded as an engineering firm in 1931 by Ferdinand Porsche and his associates. It spent its early years on questionable projects, mostly for the German government at the time. If you want to know more about how the company went from making tanks for Hitler to sports cars for trust fund babies, then you should go and watch the video I made on how history works covering the long and troubled history of the now beloved company. Porsche was instrumental in the development of the Volkswagen Group, which translates from German as people's car. Porsche Group designed the first ever Volkswagen, the Beetle, back when the people's car was owned by the people. In other words, Volkswagen was a government company. This is where things are often made unnecessarily complicated by people trying to explain this structure. Simply put, Ferdinand Porsche decided that his engineering firm was quite good at building cars, so after the Second World War, he created a subsidiary company, Porsche Automobile Group or Porsche AG. This automobile group was in turn owned by Porsche Automobile Holding. If these businesses continued to operate like this, there wouldn't be that much confusion. A lot of very large companies have self-named subsidiaries, but not many subsidiaries went on to be more noteworthy than their parent companies. Porsche still does do some engineering and design consultation, but when you think of Porsche, you immediately think of sports cars. In 1960, Volkswagen, the company that Porsche helped to kickstart, was privatized by the German government. The company was listed for investors to buy, but with a lot of limitations. No, let me call it what it is. This is f***ed up. The German government didn't like the idea of the people's car being taken over by a foreign investor or auto company. So they introduced laws that would require that an 80% consensus be reached for an acquisition event. This still technically made a hostile takeover possible, except that the German state of Lower Saxony, the state where Volkswagen headquarters and largest production facility is located, just happened to own 20.1% of the total available shares. 
This would be like the state of Michigan buying a 20.1% stake in General Motors just so it could vote down any plans to shut down factories in Detroit. This meant that the government of Lower Saxony alone could veto any acquisition resolution which ensured that the company stayed operating as is, and that the people of Lower Saxony would hold on to their largest employer. This didn't stop Porsche Holding from making some investments in Volkswagen over the years, though they were mostly small, and just a way for the automaker to diversify their investments. Porsche Holding itself went public in 1987, but if you hadn't guessed already, it wasn't a straightforward process. The shares in the company were split in two, with the first half being designated as ordinary shares to be kept by the Porsche family, and the other half were turned into preference shares, which were sold on the German stock markets to whoever wanted to buy them. Preference and ordinary shares are a bit confusing, because in these types of companies, it's the ordinary shares that you really want. Ordinary or common shares give you voting rights, and since the Porsche family had all the ordinary shares, they kept all of the voting rights. The investors buying the preference shares may not have any say in how the company is run, but in the event of corporate insolvency, they are paid out before ordinary shareholders, hence why these shares are called preference shares. The two businesses had a shared history, but they mostly did their own things for most of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Volkswagen worked on economy mass market cars, and Porsche made expensive sport cars while diversifying into other investments and continuing their design and engineering offices. But then, in 1993, the European Union was formed. The EU had several rules which were not compatible with the laws that Germany introduced to keep Volkswagen under the control of Lower Saxony. The EU was established to promote business activity, and archaic laws that kept companies under government control were going to hurt this mission. Now, any company that wanted to take control of Volkswagen could, so long as it controlled a majority stake in the business. That was still no small feat, considering the company had been listed for decades and was owned by thousands of different investors. Lots of companies were still interested in trying, however, because thanks to the protections given to it since the 60s, Volkswagen was worth more than it was broken up than if it was kept together as an automaker. Porsche Holding was one of the companies that started buying Volkswagen shares, eventually buying up a significant stake that it was assumed that a takeover was inevitable. Porsche Holdings continually denied any plans for a takeover, and basically maintained the line that it just liked the company. Porsche. There is no substitute. Porsche eventually raised its stake to over 50% of total shares outstanding, but it needed to take a large amount of debt to do so. At its peak, it had 10 billion euros of debt, and it was only able to meet its repayments by selling some of its shares to the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund. The only way that Porsche Holding really had a chance to buy back these shares was by taking control of Volkswagen and using the piles of cash that the much larger company had to pay off its debt. In 2012, Porsche Holdings took control of the Volkswagen Auto Group. It then sold its most valuable asset, Porsche Automobiles, to Volkswagen in exchange for enough money to buy back the ordinary shares from the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund, once again making the Porsche family the exclusive voting power in the company. The history in corporate intrigue is very interesting, but the simple breakdown is that Porsche Holdings is just an investment firm that used to own Porsche Automobiles. It sold Porsche Automobiles to another company it owns, the Volkswagen Group. In the last 10 years, the Volkswagen Group has been able to add significant value to the Porsche brand by sharing R&D costs amongst its other car brands. The Volkswagen Group wants to realize the value that it has added to the brand by selling Porsche and returning the money it makes to its shareholders. The only confusing part is that Volkswagen Group's biggest shareholder also just happens to be a company with Porsche in its name that was founded by the same family. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. Germans like to over-engineer their corporate structures just as much as they like to over-engineer their cars. Now, if you want to learn the full history of how Porsche went from making tanks to making sports cars, go and check out my video on how history works for the full timeline. And a special thanks again to Noah for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works. Got a little surprise for you, son. What kind of surprise? Yeah, a little surprise. No. No, 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 Dad! Oh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, I am. You're not getting a Porsche. <laughs>